being free from oppression, demonic oppression, demonic possession. Uh, we're going to be talking about generational curses and all the things that the devil wants to do to uh, eat your lunch. But how many of you know that God is greater? Yeah. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Yeah. And so when we accept Christ as our Savior, how many believers do I have in the house for that? All right. When we accept Christ as our Savior, we too have been given that anointing and that assignment to break the works of the devil. And some of us fall in and become, get, fall into the traps of the enemy because we don't have knowledge of the word, because we don't have the word planted in our heart. But tonight we're going to give you the word of God so that you can put in your heart, put in your mind, put in your mouth, and destroy to be the word yeah, of the enemy. Isn't that good? Yeah. And before I get in, and, and we, you know, I hate talking about the devil. I, I, I struggled on even doing this sermon, this uh, series, because I don't want to talk about the devil all the time. I want to talk about Jesus. So I'm going to do my best to give you more scriptures to talk about Jesus more than the devil, because the Bible says he's already been defeated. Yeah. Right? Right. He was defeated 2,000 years ago at Calvary. It's been done. All we have to do is to learn to walk in it. I was, uh, I was meeting with some dear friends of mine this week. Most of you, or a lot of you know, um, uh, Robert and Tina Miller. And uh, they've been good friends of this ministry for a long, long time. I, I met Robert years ago when I was a kid as a youth pastor. And, um, and Tina I met uh, probably 20 years ago now. She used to work in the White House. And, and as a matter of fact, she took my wife and I um, to Washington, her and Robert gave us a tour of the White House and the, uh, we didn't go in the Oval Office that trip, that was another trip. But anyway, they're just wonderful people and Robert had knee replacement surgery and so uh, Tina called and said, can you come over and pray for Robert? And I said, sure. So the other day I came over there and, and uh, you know, he's laying in bed with his leg up and and Tina invites me into the bedroom where he's laying, and they have a two-story house, and he was in the downstairs bedroom, and he was laying there. And we were talking, and I, I, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. You ever see that? You ever see something where you think something's running across the floor, and you go, what, what was that? Well, usually, as a believer, you need to be in tune. Because many times, God is manifesting to you. He is showing to you something good or something bad. He's either showing you demons and letting you know that they're there. And why does he do that? To take authority over them. And sometimes he lets you see angels. And I've seen more demons in my time than I care to, to care to see. And I've only seen angels a few times. And I saw this out of the corner of my eye. And I'm trying to carry on a conversation, and I look, and the Lord speaks to me and said, you're seeing an angel. And when I looked, I saw this angel, the bottom half, in two-story house, and the second, uh, the other part was in the two-story section of the house. And so we got ready to go, and I prayed, and I said, by the way, the Lord wants you to know that there is an angel in this house and he's standing right over there. Well, I don't know if you know Tina as well as I do, but she's a little, uh, she's not a charisma uh, charismatic, she's a charismaniac. What do I mean by that? She just really gets carried away when she hears and sees spiritual stuff. And she started shouting and, and uh, you know, speaking in tongues and, and stuff. And she said, thank you for that confirmation. I said, confirmation, what are you talking about? And she shows me her ring door. Uh, you have those ring cameras that, that catch things. And they have on their ring camera, they have hot angelic beings. Flashes of light, all kinds of wonderful things. And I said, thank you, Lord, that you're showing me angels as we're uncovering the works of the devil. Do you want to see angels? Yes. I tell you what, angels are, are spectacular. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, now that, let them know that that's not a warring angel. That's a worshiping angel. And he's there because their worship invited the angel to come and to worship 
to bring the presence of God. Oh, that's good stuff, isn't it? And I said to him before I went, I said, now what's on the what's on the second, what's on what's on the top of the, you know, what's the room that is right above? And uh, and get this. They, they have two bedrooms upstairs, and they had a spare bedroom at the very end, and they turned it into a chapel where they go and worship and stuff. And I said, see, and, and listen, this is key. When you worship, when you speak the word, you attract good things. When you are not in your right mind and under the influence of substances, when you're cussing all the time, when you're when you're thinking bad things, when you have unforgiveness in your heart, guess what? You're going to have those things come to you. You know what I'm saying? Come in. And we're going to talk more about that tonight. But give the Lord a hand clap. Did that touch anybody other than me? I just think that's a great story. So tonight, Pastor Jim, we're going to go into part two. And, and you're going to kind of give us uh, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to get into this. And, and, and it's, it's so good when we teach together because this is going to be kind of long tonight, maybe longer than you're used to. But stay with us. Take notes. Get out a pad of paper. Get your phone. Uh, I take notes on your phone. But write it down because we're going to give you tools in Scripture that you're going to need for deliverance from demonic oppression demonic possession, and generational curses. Pastor Jeff, give Amen. us our intro here. Amen. Am I on? You're on. Woo! You're in a cave, but you're on. A little echo. Hey, I want you to get your Bibles out and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be reading a verse that's not on, on the board. But uh, tonight, I hope that you take some good notes, because we're going to be giving you some, uh, it, it could be considered deep, but understand it, this is going to be life trans. Forming information that we're going to give you. You know, uh, a Sunday school teacher asked her class, what happened when Adam and Eve fell in the garden? Well, most of the children were puzzled, but one little girl stood up and announced, they got dirty. <laughs> now, that may not be exactly a deep theological answer, but that little girl hit it on. I'm still echoing really bad, I think. Yeah, yeah you are. Uh, but we got dirty. And I want to begin our study tonight by sharing with you how we got into this fix in the first place and what God chose to do about it. The fall can be summarized in this way. First, God designed men and women to live at a higher level of authority, dominion and destiny. Right. That's what we were originally designed for. And that's more than what we've been currently experiencing. Second, it was the entry of sin that changed everything drastically. Now, we were created, as I stated last weekend, perfectly in the image of God. You and I were designed for higher purposes, greater things, deeper fulfillments. And that's what we long for, don't we? Yes. Now, some may question why God gave us self-will or what we call free will in the first place. You know, it, it's gotten us in a lot of trouble. Some, some would, be, would even consider it may be a flaw. I mean, wasn't it the use of self-will or free will that allowed Adam and Eve to disobey? Well, well yes, that, that, that's absolutely true. But understand that because we were created in God's image, he gave us the gift of self-will or free will. Did you know that self-will will, it, it enables us to worship God? Mm -hmm. That's why God gave us free will, the, the, the ability to make choices. Now, what does Satan usually make moves towards? Choosing our choices. You know, that's exactly what he did with, with Adam and Eve. You know, when he, when he offered them that, that, that fruit, that forbidden fruit, they saw that it was what? That it was good for food, right. that it was pleasing to the eyes, and it was great for attaining wisdom. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, the devil has been using that uh, against us. 
In other words, options, choices, and it gets us in trouble all the time, doesn't it? When we look at, at the Genesis account, we learn three essential truths. Number one, that we were created in God's image with unimaginable destiny and purpose. The second thing is we were given dominion over the earth, which included dominion over the animals or dominion in, in relationships and dominion over plant life. We could, and, and the third thing is this. We would find our purpose in a love relationship with God expressed in obedience and worship. Right. Now, as a result of the fall, we lost two things. You want to write these down. We lost two things because of the fall. We lost one, rulership, and two, relationship. Mm -hmm. That's what we lost. And without the, re the restoration... Of these two things, God's original plan and destiny for us cannot be fulfilled. But he wants to restore relationship and rulership back to us. Now you may wonder, what, what, what does this have to do? I mean, what does the whole issue of the fall and how we got dirty, what does this have to do with deliverance, with being set free? I'll tell you why. See, if you don't understand what you lost, you won't understand what's available for you to gain. We have to know what we lost in order to appreciate those things that God wants to restore back to us. You know, for the most part, we hear, we hear preaching and teaching that is focused on the restoration of men and women back to God. Reconciling us back to God and how Jesus went to the cross and bore our sins and was resurrected again. Now that, that message is absolutely necessary. I mean John 3, 3 tells us that we need to be what? We need to be born again. So that's absolutely important and absolutely necessary. But ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. Coming to Christ is the starting point for you and I. That's the door. That's the gateway. Now, how many believers are there that, that year after year, all they have to talk about is their conversion? They're, they're still merely converts. And all they can testify to is their conversion. But there is something so much more. Salvation, again, is the beginning. That is the starting point. Do you know that, that there's so much more to God's redemptive plan for you and I? Right. It transcends a restored relationship, but it also includes a restored you. Now listen to me. Salvation, as I said, is the beginning. But salvation is a word that God works in you Throughout the entirety of your life. Now he restores you in salvation back to God. But there is a greater work that he wants to do in you and I. And that is restore you and I back to that place of destiny. Back to that place of rulership and relationship. That is, that is in a nutshell why... He's provided deliverance for us. That's his plan for us. And listen. Restoration and recovery are synonymous with each other. See, when we talk about restoration, we are talking about recovery. So guess what that means? That means that every one of us here that call ourselves followers of Jesus are all in the process of recovery. Yes. Yeah. You know, we, we hear recovery sometimes and we go, well, that's just for those alcoholics or those, that's just for those drug addicts. But I got news for you. Recovery is for all of us and we are all in recovery. Right. Now I have to turn in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and I'm just going to read verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed.
passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, what is this new creation that the Apostle Paul is talking about? It is the person who has a restored mind, a restored identity, and restored authority over themselves and over the enemy. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's what a new creation is. That's what a new creation represents. And, and I don't know about you, but that's exciting to me. Yeah, yeah. I get excited when I, when I think about what God is creating in me. That I am not the old me, but I am the new yeah. creation in Christ. So, so you got to get this. God didn't just save you so you could go to heaven. God didn't just save you so you, you, you could wear a, a, a cross around your neck or grace a, a, a chair in the church or listen to KW radio all day. <laughs> listen, there, there, there's more. There's more. He didn't save you so you could debate whether there's a rapture or not. I know Christians love to debate that all the time. But listen, God saved you so he could begin the restoration mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. of restoring you back to your original design. Yeah. Amen. What he has always designed for you to be and to live the life that he always destined for you to live. You know, even today as I was preparing, I, I, I got this word in my spirit that we settle. Mm -hmm. Don't we? We settle. You know, sometimes I'll go into a store with my wife, and, and you know you've got th this item for a for dollar ninety-nine, and this item over here for three ninety-nine. And I know we all need to be frugal, but you know, the tendency, at least for me, is I will always go to the dollar ninety-nine one, and you know what that you'll say when you get what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> And listen, as believers, we do that, especially when it comes to living the life that God has called us to live. We settle. We settle. And God doesn't want you and I to settle anymore. He's got more for you. Yes. Quit listening to believing the lies of the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Quit settling and receive what God has planned yeah. for you from the very yeah. beginning. Right. You need to get to I will pay nothing less than God says for me. Amen. How, how does God work his restoration in you? He does it piece by piece, bit by bit, little here and little there. Now, who is the agent of restoration? The Holy Spirit is the agent of restoration. You see, he executes what the Father has told him to execute. He does the revealing and then he executes Jesus' healing yeah. over your life. That's right. That's good. Good. And the Holy Spirit is the one that's involved in this whole process of restoration. Mm -hmm. And I believe even those of you that were here last Saturday and those of you that are maybe here for the first time in this series, I believe that even as Pastor and I teach, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you even now. And he's going to highlight an area or something that you need to be set free from. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, when God saves you, he begins that process of delivering you from demonic attachments. And we're going to be talking about attachments. And he's going to deliver you from the injuries that have happened to your soul. Now, I know that, that that sounds a little deep. Soul injuries, soul wounds. Whether you realize it or not, we've all encountered those soul wounds. We have. But I believe that Jesus is about ready to set some people free. Yes. And to break yeah. the devil's bondage right. yeah, that he has had you in. Now, now last Saturday, we, we started with the series of Freedom Tools, the Overcomer's Arsenal. And we laid out three foundational truths to give us a solid foundation for what we'll be teaching through the, the next several weekends. And tonight, we're going to be doing part two. We're going to be laying down three more foundations. So I want to begin with the first one tonight. So take good notes. Number one is this. Another foundational truth is we come with unknown attachments. 
Another word that you could use for attachments is strongholds. Many of us are familiar with that term, strongholds. That's basically what I mean when I'm talking about an attachment. Now, other than Pastor A, none of us came out of our mother's womb born again. <laughs> right? Right. Right? If you were baptized as an infant, you did not automatically become immune from demonic influence over the course of your life. And even though as a little child you were not held responsible for your sin until you came to a particular age of accountability, the fact remains we were all born little sinners. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, that, that's a fact. Amen. And being that we were born into a sinful world means that we were born susceptible to sinful influences and other people's sins. You know, other people's sins affect us. Right. Do you remember the accounts where the Pharisees began to accuse Jesus, or they told Jesus in John 8, 41, where they basically said, you were born of fornication. Remember that passage? They told Jesus he was born of fornication. Basically, what they were doing was they, and possibly they were referencing maybe some gossip that they heard that Joseph was not Jesus' biological father and some crazy story about a virgin birth. <laughs> that's, that's why they told Jesus that you were born of fornication. What they were insinuating was this, that Jesus was born cursed and that Jesus was born a sinner, simply because of what his parents allegedly did. Now the Bible talks about generational curses that can affect our lives, and we'll be addressing those. But what I want you to realize is that there are things generationally and from our own past that will attach themselves or build a stronghold in us. And you might want to refer to these things as baggage. Or as I like to call them, hitchhikers. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, we're not talking about demon uh, uh, possession by no means. But little hooks that the enemy puts in us. Right. That, that stay with us until Jesus breaks them free off of us. Yeah. Now, what are unknown attachments and, and how do they manage to connect to us? Well, I call them unknown attachments because... Oftentimes we are unaware of an event that maybe we maybe we don't remember. And many times our memory, because especially if something traumatic happens, like like abuse as, as a child, our mind sometimes will block those those instances instances out. Mm -hmm. But because of that event, that tragic event, there's an attachment because of what the enemy does to us. There's an attachment or a stronghold or a hook that is put in you and I because of that event. And, and that's what an attachment is. It, it attaches itself by way of the offense or, or wound for the purpose of control. Or a better way to understand attachments, again, is to look at them as, as hooks. You guys remember that, that uh, movie Ghostbusters? You remember, I, I think it was uh, Bill Murray's uh, act role, and, and he, they would go and they would fight these alien beings, and, and all of a sudden, he, he, he'd have all this slime all over him. And what would he say? I would slime. I would slime. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a crude illustration, but in reality, when you and I are out in the world, and especially before we became Christians, when we go into situations where the demonic presences are, we get slime. We, we get slime. Now, I like you like that hook. You know, you go fishing, and, and they, they throw a hook out into the water, and that fish takes that hook, and as that fish is fighting, it's being drunk. It's being drunk. What, what is happening is being controlled. Yeah. And that's what attachments do. They end up controlling us. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever questioned yourself about why you deal with an extreme temper? Mm. Or when you encounter moments of rage and you wonder, where, where does that come from? 
Yeah. Oh, that must be just because I'm Irish. I used to use that. You can't use that. <laughs> right? Or, or, or not just rage. Uh, what if you just suddenly, you find yourself bombarded with, with sexual, wicked sexual thoughts? Things of that nature. We're all tempted. But I'm talking about something that even transcends uh, even a temptation. With wicked thoughts. Or what about the inability to sustain or to keep yourself in a loving relationship for longer than 24 hours? <laughs> yeah? That's a real situation, isn't it? Yes, it is. Isn't it? Or, or what about fear and depression? Those are, those are issues that the enemy will use a hook to drag and control you. Or depression that renders you absolutely helpless and, and confused. Where do those attachments come from? And what enables them to have so much control over us? Well, at, at the risk of trying to be overly introspective and to, to not psychoanalyze yourself, You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to address those issues within you and trust him because he knows what he's doing. Right. But at the same time, we need to address these issues as he brings them to our minds and our hearts. Now, some people ask, is it always necessary to go back to the root, to go back to the actual moments when the event, the offense, the, the hurt, the wound, is it always necessary to go back? And my answer is no. It's not always necessary to go back. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, through words of knowledge and, and words of revelation, will take that person back, to take a person back to that event. But at other times, the Holy Spirit will not do that. God knows when it's necessary. And especially for those of you that God will be using in assisting others into freedom from past hurts, you have to be careful not to force open a door that God does not want open yet. That's true. That's true. All right, just so you understand that. I, I remember that, that case in the Gospels where Jesus, uh, they, they brought to uh, Jesus' disciples a little boy. That was demon possessed. And if you remember, the disciples couldn't cast the demon out. So they ended up bringing the little boy to Jesus. And, and the little boy began to, 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 to manifest in front of Jesus. And Jesus asked this man a very important question. Do you remember what he asked him? How long has he been like this? There's a sermon in there. And I hope one day I can, I can preach it. But when Jesus was saying, how long has he been like this? I believe Jesus was going back to the moment when that little boy, when that little boy had been touched by something vile. Or somebody had done something to that little boy that opened up a door for that little boy to be demon possessed. I believe that's what Jesus was talking about. But understand that many of us are dealing with strongholds and attachments that come as a result of something that has happened in our past. So sometimes God will bring us right to the roots and show us where the wound happened. But there are other times when God will just absolutely set you free immediately with breakthrough without having you go back. Now, Attachments come, strongholds come by way of injury. I remember on one occasion that uh, at a company that I was working for, we, we got broken into. I know that happens every day around here all the time now. But we got broken into. And the business manager had to go to court. They arrested this guy, the police got him. And the business owner had to go to court. And, and I'm not making this stuff up. In court, the business manager was asked this question. Did you invite this man into your establishment? Did you leave the door unlocked that allowed this man to have entry?
one. 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 So based on that, we understand there's a spiritual connection that occurs between the soul of the man and the soul of a woman established through the physical union. See, so many people take for granted the deepness of sexual union in marriage. The Bible says that you become one with that person. Now, we know that sex was created by God. Amen? Amen? It was a gift to man and woman. Why do you think Satan so targets sex in our world? He hates it because it was a gift. It was a pure gift. And it is a pure gift that comes from God. So, so here's what happens with the soul talk. You may have had a, you know, a seemingly innocent fling a, a, as a young person. <coughs> maybe you know, before you were married. Or maybe you had an adulterous affair with somebody and you were never found out. No, no, one, no one even knows about it. At all. Listen, that soul tie, that connection served to attach, to connect you spiritually with that person. That's heavy, isn't it? Yeah. That's heavy. And, and a lot of people don't, don't realize this. The Bible says that you became one with that person on a spiritual level. Because sex is more than just a physical union. Sex is a spiritual union. There is something that happens in the spirit when two souls are joined together through that union. That's right. You may not see that person for decades. You may never ever see that person again for the rest of your life. But this is the sobering truth that a piece of that person's soul is now tied to your soul. That's the truth. That's what happens in a sexual union. Now, by the way, soul ties transcend even sex. Unhealthy relationships are also something that can give us unhealthy attachments. Now, understand, you may not have a clue that there are certain things that come out in your life and you wonder, where in the world are these things coming from? And again, as an unknown attachment, you may not realize, but it may possibly be the result of a soul tie that you need to break. That's the good news. Yeah. God can break that soul tie off of you. You don't have to carry that person with you for the rest right. of your life. Now, that may answer some questions about some things that you've been dealing with throughout your life and never even knew it. But it remains a fact that because of that, that, that spiritual union based on the physical union, that there can evolve an attachment. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Which is another name for the devil. Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Amen. Now this brings to mind a believer. Now, I, now I'm talking about as a believer that you have absolutely no business going into an environment where there is witchcraft being openly practiced. Amen. All right? I'm gone to meddling now. I'm gone from teaching to meddling. <laughs> but this is important, yeah. Christian. This is important for you to understand. I just read a scripture where you are told not to be yoked with unbelievers. And that is more than just a relationship. Because usually we use that scripture for talking about, about marriage relationships. But what does light have to do with darkness? You have no business being in an environment where witchcraft is being openly practiced. That is an open door. A believer who opens a porn website, you have no business opening that door because, see, that's the enemy's domain. 
Those are the areas where spiritual attachments or spiritual strongholds can attach themselves to you. We're talking about open doors. About open doors. Or maybe you've had an issue with addiction in the past, and so when you find yourself tempted, that you think, well, you know, just one little hit or one little swallow, and no one will know. Listen, that is a gateway, that is a door. That you open yourself up to the enemy, and it is a way, again, that the enemy will attach himself to you. This isn't even including the baggage that we bring from our past before we come to Christ. Now, Ephesians 5, verse 8 through 11 says this. For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord, and have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. You need to underline, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Now let me finish with this on attachments. Now I've gone as far as to say that you and I have all come. We've all got our baggage. We've all, we've all come with our strongholds and those attachments. But listen, that does not mean that you're not born again. Right. That does not mean that God does not love you, that God doesn't love you. It does not mean that God is mad at you. It doesn't mean that you are demon-possessed. It doesn't mean any of those things. But what it does mean is that God wants to set you free from those things. Right. He wants to set you free from that, those hooks and from the influence and control that those attachments have had on you. See, it's freedom. It's breakthrough. That's what God has designed for you. Can you say amen? amen. That's what what's in Woo! How many of you have ever been on a keto diet? Come on, raise your hand. It's okay. Ever been on a keto diet? No carbs, all protein. Yeah, it's really good because they tell you you can eat all the bacon you want. So that's, you know, that was what was appealing to me. But then the reality hits that on a keto diet, you can eat proteins and meats, which is our protein, but you can't eat carbs, which include bread. Yeah. So, you know, you think you're doing real good until you go to the restaurant like uh, Texas Roadhouse. You know, before you order, you order your steak, and what do they do? They bring out this big basket full of homemade bread. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and you can smell the sourdough. Mmm. And you're on that keto diet, and, and they wrap that up, and they put the butter right next to it, and, and when it's wrapped there, and the, the heat from the bread starts melting the butter, and you can just smell it all over, and then that voice inside of you says, just one. <laughs> just, just one. And so you soon you break and you have that one. And then after you have the one, you think, well, I've blown it. I might as well have another. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And then after that, you think, well, I've really blown it. I might as well eat the whole basket. <laughs> and then you wake up the next morning and you're feeling really guilty and you think, well, there's always tomorrow. <laughs> and then the next day you always say, well, there's always next year. How many of you know that your choices affect your will and your willpower, good and bad? What happens? What happens on a keto diet when they bring you that stuff, you should do what? You should push it away and say to yourself, no, I'm not going to do that. And then when the waiter comes, you say, no, thank you. Take this bread back to the pit of the kitchen where it belongs. Right. Right? But we don't do that. And we open the door to the enemy. Number two, write this down. I'm going to go through these quickly. There's always a cause. There's always a cause. I said this last week, Sunday morning, I'm going to say it again. There's a reason that you are, are where you are in your life right now. Amen. There's a reason. It didn't just happen. 
I've been talking about the heart on Sunday morning, tomorrow morning. I'm going to talk about the heart. It goes right along with this. You need to be there or watch the, the program tomorrow because our heart is the key to where we're going. Our heart is the key to where we are right now. And the choices that we made are why you're in the position that you are right now. You might say, well, I, I'm in a pretty good position. And then you made good choices. You might say, oh, I'm in a terrible position. You didn't make good choices. I'm not here to condemn you. I don't want you to feel bad. I just want you to know that you're not where you are by happenstance. You are not where you are uh, because you have bad luck. Or did I almost knock that off? All right, I just get to go on in as much. Anyway, but, but, but there's a cause. There's a reason why you are where you are. Whether you're dealing with demonic oppression. How many have been demonically oppressed? You know, you can just feel that evil. Whether you've been demonic oppressed or demonic possessed, or you're dealing with demonic oppression or possession, there's a reason why you're dealing with it. Possession, again, as Pastor Jeff said, possession is when a person gives himself over to Satan. Possession is when a demon comes inside of you and lives. Oppression is when there's an outside attack from a demon who attracts himself to a person. In order for a person to be demon-possessed, there must, as Pastor Jeff said, there must be a door for the demon to enter. Charles Kraft, who wrote a lot of great books on demon possession and getting free, he said this, and, and I don't know if I put that in the notes, and I don't know if Becky can put them up there, but I'm going to say this and I'll repeat it so you can write it down. He said, demons are like rats. They need garbage to feed on. I'm going to say it again. Demons are like rats. They need garbage to feed on. Now, if you want to be free from a demon, you must be willing to get rid of the garbage that they're feeding on. That's good. That's good. If you're involved in witchcraft or the occult, that demon will feed off the garbage you put into your mind by books, by seances, by witchcraft, by being around evil, uh, uh, and being around people that are practicing the occult rituals. You must stop, you must make a decision to stop, you must repent, and then you have legal, act, legal authority to tell the demon that you legally invited in to move away. Okay? Demons operate in a legal system. They know the rules, they know the laws, and they know how to play. A demon can only enter a person when that person gives that demon legal access. And a person can only expel a demon when they know their legal rights, that they have authority over them to cast them out. Now, I've cast the devil out of people. It's no fun. I don't look forward to it. I don't look for demons. But when I come across them, I get rid of them. But you know what the most effective exorcism is? When you, as a, when you come to Christ and you know the authority that you have, you yeah. take authority to cast that sucker out. Right. Amen. Amen. That's the most effective. Maybe you're dealing with drug abuse. The demon feeds off the garbage that your behavior attracts when you participate in drugs. If you want to be free, you must make a choice. You must repent and cast him out. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 11 in the Message Bible says, and how many of you can agree with this? The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. And if you don't believe that, just get married and you'll know that. Because the heart is sin anyway. But the Bible goes on to say, but I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get the heart. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not what they pretend to be. Ooh, that's good. So let's go to the root of things. Satan can only come into a person when he has been given legal access. And there are 13 ways you and I can give him legal access. And I want you to write these down. Number one, willful sin. Willful sin. When you begin to sin and you have no 
thought of repenting. You have no want to in you. You're giving Satan legal access into that part of your life. Number two, the second way legal access of a demon comes in is the occult. Pastor Jeff already talked about this, but let me, let me go a little farther. Ouija boards. That's, that's not a game that Mattel came up with. It's witchcraft. It, it, it calls demons to people. It causes demons to come into people and to come into homes. Don't play with it. You know what? I tell you, it was so, it's so funny that because all three of my kids, I told them, I said, if you ever go to somebody's house and they bring out a Ouija board, you run. My kids have not always been on the straight and narrow. But I tell you one thing they know, don't mess with witchcraft. Right. The third thing is generational. What do I mean by that? Some things are handed down generation to generation. Now I'll deal with that in just a moment when we talk about curses. The fourth is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness corrodes the container in which it is, it is carried in. I'll say that again. Unforgiveness corrodes the container in which it is carried in. If you are carrying around unforgiveness, it will corrode you. And that will invite the devil, either with possession or oppression, into your life. Number five, trauma. Trauma in your life, things that Satan convinces you, and then uh, our trauma in your life happens, and then Satan convinces you, you'll never get over it. And when you accept that, and you begin to speak that, you give the devil the legal right to be there. Yeah, yeah he'll tell you it was your fault. See, listen, <coughs> children are victims because they don't have a choice. And that's why children are victimized by adults. Because adults come into their life. A child doesn't know they have choices, and so they do something to them, uh, sexually or mentally or physically, or, or, or uh, some kind of abuse happens in their life, and it's happened to a lot of people, okay? And, and they, they put that wound, that scar, and there's also comes a demonic attachment. And then, and then what Satan says is they grow older. Well, you know, it was your fault. You could have said no. Amen. That's a life on the pit of hell. Listen, if you've been hurt as a child, you were hurt because you didn't have choices. Right. Now that you're an adult, you're no longer a victim because you have a choice. Yeah. You can't choose what happened to you in the past, but you can choose how you respond to it. Right. And I'm going to respond to it. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Number seven, or number six, abuse. Number seven, unhealthy soul ties. Pastor Jeff already covered that. Number eight, curses. Have you ever heard of family curses? Have you ever heard of generational curses? Did you know there's also generational blessings? Yes. yes. Woo Don't ever forget that. God says that if you follow me, I will bless you. I will bless your children. I will bless your children's children. I will bless you to a thousand generations. Woo! I believe that I am experiencing some of the blessings in my life because my mom, my grandma, my great grandma, and so on, prayed blessings over me that I'm experiencing today because that's a promise of God. But curses work the same way. How many of you ever heard of the Kennedy curse? The Kennedys, a, a very prominent political family in America. What happened? Most Kennedys have died tragically. Why? People that aren't even believers will say, oh, the Kennedy curse. Now, I'm not saying that to put them down, but we've all heard that term. And Bible scholars and other people that have studied attachments and possession have said that because of the sin of the father, Joseph Kennedy, in bootlegging, has opened a door that cost him his life. He died an old man, but he had a stroke and it was not pleasant. 
and, and most of his children and even grandchildren. Okay? You don't have to live under a family curse. You can break it. Yes. Yes. Now, I have some blessing on my side of the family, but there's also been some things I had to break. Yeah. Okay? This is what Satan does. You have an absentee father. Maybe he's a workaholic. Maybe he's in prison. Maybe he's a drug addict. Maybe he's just not there. There is a sense that opens the door to a sense of abandonment. An orphan heart. If your parents can't stay with you, this is what, this is the, the lie of the enemy. This is what the lie of the enemy does. If my parents, my dad or my mom couldn't even stay with me, then why would anybody? You see how the seed is planted? You see how the seed is planted? It begins to grow by our thoughts, our words, and our actions. There are so many people that have been hurt by the abandonment of parents. Whether that parent meant to or not, that's not the issue. It happened, and if it happens, and if it has happened to you, it has probably opened the door for Satan to come in to make you feel bad. And what happens when you when you, when you feel bad, you want to feel better. So what do you do to feel better? You medicate. How do you medicate? Just like when you go to a doctor, you take pills, you drink something, relationships, that kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about? You're not a bad person because you're a drug addict. You're not a bad person because you're an alcoholic. You're not a bad person because you go from relationship to relationship. You're a hurt person that's trying to do the natural thing. Feel better. Get better. But the only problem is that is the deception of the enemy that will even get you into worse hot water than you were when you just had the abandonment. Abandonment issues are huge. I had a lady tell my wife when I one time she said, well, I was abused. Didn't, didn't bother me. Didn't, didn't make any difference at all in my life. I said, really? She said, yep. Yeah. She said, I don't know why you're going through all this stuff. Uh, she said, I, I don't know why you're going through all this stuff. And, and making such a big deal of it didn't affect me at all. I said, do you think maybe uh, it's uh, that's why you smoke marijuana every day? Do you think maybe it uh, affected you in the fact that you are 50 years old and you've never been married and you've never had a relationship more than a year? And I began to point out things in her life that weren't natural. And you know, she looked, I'll never forget, I'll never, ever forget. She looked at me, she went, wow, I never thought of that. Why? Because she was deceived. The devil deceived her. The devil talked her into the lie that it didn't affect you. If you want to know if something affects you or not, look at the symptoms of your life. Because if you have symptoms of a cold, guess what? You probably have a cold. Right? If you're sneezing all over everybody, your nose is stopped up, you can't breathe, your eyes are red and watery, you probably got a cold. The same thing is true spiritual. The spiritual mirrors the physical. There are symptoms in your life, and what do symptoms do? Symptoms tell you there's something wrong. Right. That's true. That's good to preach on in your agony. That's, good. That's true. Addiction. Number nine, addiction. Ten, fears and phobias. Eleven, false religions. Let me tell you, a lot of times in cultures, I know the Hispanic culture is this way. They, they have different rituals like Day of the Dead and different things like that. Those are occultic practices that they bring into Catholicism that are not of God that can get people really messed up. Yeah. Right. I'm not picking on Hispanics. Germans have things. Irish have things. Satan yeah. always likes to come in and taint goodness with something that's just a little off. Right. 
and it throws a monkey wrench into the whole problem. Right. Um, if you're into the day of the dead and worshiping the dead, you need to stop that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, I don't have anything against Halloween. Well, I take that back. I don't condemn people that have anything for Halloween. But you know why I don't even celebrate Halloween? Because why would I want to celebrate death, blood, glory? Yeah. The only thing good about Halloween is the candy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get rid of all the other crap. And let's add candy. But, you, but, but what does Satan do? What does Satan do? He puts the good in there to, like, to, to, to bring you in. As believers, we have to investigate those things. And don't become, don't become don't become legalistic, but just be smart about it. And don't go preaching to other people what they need to give up that the Holy Spirit's told you to give up. And number 12 and 13, they go together. Cursed, I'm sorry. What is 10? 10! Fear and phobias. Okay, then what's 11? False religions. And number 12 and 13. No, that's okay. I'm glad you raised your hand and said that. Yes. You'll be chasing me in the parking lot. Okay. False religions. Okay. Uh, number 12 and 13. 12 is cursed objects. And number 13 is cursed buildings. Now, let me curse buildings. Now, I don't believe that demons possess inanimate objects. I've had people say, my coffee cup is possessed. No. The Bible is very clear. Demons don't look for things to possess. Demons, in order to be effective, have to live in a body. I don't believe in haunted houses. I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in demons. And I believe that there are demons in houses. I believe that there are uh, curses that are put on objects. What is a curse? Let me read this to you real quick. A curse is residual energy left by the speaking of words. A curse is residual energy, meaning somebody put it there a long time ago and it's still living. Blessings are the same way. Blessings are a residual energy that are left by somebody pronouncing a blessing. Amen? Are you enjoying this so far? Yeah. I, I know we're going a long time, but you, but, but you need to know these things, okay? There are no such thing as ghosts. There are, let me tell you, there is no such thing as talking to the dead. Well, there's a lady on TV, she talks to the dead. No, she talks to demons that disguise themselves as the person that died. Listen, the Bible is very emphatic. There shall be no talking to the dead. Right. Exactly. Why? Because the dead can't talk to you. They've gone to their yeah. reward, heaven or hell. But the, it sounded like my grandpa. Only my grandpa knew that. No demons know that too. Yeah. And when you go to somebody who talks to your dead relatives for you, and you're communicating, you have opened a door to give a demon legal access to when you play the Ouija board and read tarot cards, you have given Satan a yes. legal access. You have opened the door to let him into your life. Oh, it's just a Oh, they're just card. We just do it for fun. Yeah, that's what Satan wants you to think. A lot of things in life start out as fun. Oh, we smoked pot. We got high. Oh, we did a little whoa. Oh, it was so much fun. We had this and we had that. Oh, it's fun until it has you. And then the fun's no longer. I have a friend. She came to this church. Uh, she's a pastor in Australia. She was a psychic healer before she knew Jesus. She would pull things out of people. She'd pull sickness out of people. And you know what she said? One thing they don't tell you. When you pull bad things out of people, it comes up good. And she said, it was fun when I started. And then it began to possess me. Oh, yeah, I was bringing other people. 
Christ died. That she accepted Christ as her Savior. She pronounced that. And she left. Pastor Jeff, we'll have to wrap it up. All right. The, the last foundational truth is this. This is the good news. This, out of all the six foundational truths, is the one you absolutely have to get. And that's this. God has a plan solution. No matter where you came from, no matter what your past is, no matter what you've been involved in, you are not a hopeless case. Right. Listen, you may have reached a point where you, you, you've tried everything to be set free. You recognize that the, you, the bondages and those attachments, you know they exist, you know they're there, but you've just given up. You've got no hope. Listen, God had the solution before you ever even had a Amen. Come on. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Amen. Listen, God is the one that initiated that. Amen. He brought you Amen. near. He may seem to you like a million miles away. But thank the Lord. Amen. He has brought you near. You guys remember that song we used to, that little chorus we used to sing this years ago? Satan had me bound, but Jesus, Jesus set me free. free. That's the truth. There is not a demon in hell that can keep you in bondage. Right. There is not an addiction. There is not anything whatsoever, no stronghold, that can keep God from setting you free. Amen. That's the truth. Let me introduce this verse, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it all away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed, and this is what I want you to get, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. Give the Lord a hand, God. I know this was long, and, and, and I apologize for the time, but, but you, there, there's no good way to cut this off. Okay, you needed all this information. Go back; it'll be on our website. It'll be on our website, and it'll also be on Facebook. Before we pray, I see some new folks that are here tonight. How did How did you come? To, how did you hear about us tonight? Uh, Facebook. Facebook. All right. Facebook. All right. Well, it's good because I saw a whole bunch of you guys coming in. I don't know if you're all together. Or what. But we welcome you here today. I have a book that I've written, Fifty Shades of Grace. It's on the back, and, and uh, my ushers are going to give them to you right now. And if uh, if you don't have a copy, I'd like for you to give that to you as a gift. Uh, just raise your hand, and it will get you there. Uh, the rest of us, as power heads, and close our eyes, and we're going to pray. And I'm going to teach you how to pray to get rid of demonic oppression and possession. But let me tell you this before we pray. Know what you're doing. The Bible says that when a demon is cast out, now whether, I believe, whether it's in you or on you, you need to get rid of them. Amen? Amen. But the Bible says that when a demon comes in and he is cast out, and we're going to talk more about this in this series, he goes to a, a, a barren place for a season, and then he comes back. And if he finds the house swept and clean, he goes and finds seven ugly brothers worse than him and comes back. Don't pray this prayer that I'm about to pray unless you've made a decision to be free. Now, I don't just mean that to scare you. I mean that to help you. Amen? Amen. So whatever it is in your life that has opened the door, I just ask right now that you ask the Holy Spirit. What opened that door? How did I open that door? And then this is what I want you to do. I want you to say to the Lord, God, I repent of that in the name of Jesus. Just tell God, God, I repent for giving the devil legal access into that part of my life. I repent. And I make a choice stop that activity.
activity that he's opened the door. If it's drugs, and he made the choice, I'm not going to do drugs. And I'm sorry, God, I opened the door. Pornography, whatever. God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that anymore. I want you to lift your hands as a sign of surrender to the Lord. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me if you want to be set free tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's all pray it. Father, in the name of Jesus, I renounce every spirit of the Holy Spirit. I command every attachment, every possession to leave me now in the name of Jesus. I renounce every hex, every curse, every spell. In Jesus' name, you have to go now. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Come on, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Right now, Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit with an evidence of spiritual language. Father, touch me like nobody, like nobody's ever touched me before, God. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. There's three ways to give for the offering tonight. You can give cash or check. There's Wi-Fi in the room. You can go to, you can text. The word give to area code 661 Put the word give. Put your bank information there. You can give that way. Or you can go to our website, greasebakersfield.org. Hit the giving button and you can give that way. Would you stand with us tonight? And Pastor Jeff's going to pray over your offering and pray a dismissal prayer. Pastor Jeff. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. And Lord, as, as, as we give, I just ask that you would just pour out a blessing on me. Yes. And Father, we thank you for this word. This is deep. And we know, we know that you want to transform our lives. We ask you to see me to our hearts and our lives and let us take it outside these doors. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Our 10 o'clock service tomorrow. We'll be talking about the heart. Tune in.